what can I focus on that would make him, that would drive him to want to live and come back over that rail? So I started talking more about his daughter. What is she like? How old is she? Describe her to me. So he was doing all this and I could see the emotions were starting to take effect. And this went on for some time. And then I wanted to take a break. And I do this every so often because I want folks to really think about what we have been talking about. So I asked him, I said, Kev, we've been talking for a while. I want to step back and give you some time to think, but I'm only going to do so if you promise me not to do anything until I come back up here. And he said, sure. So I stepped back about 10 feet or so and gave him just a few minutes to think about things. And then after a few minutes, I raised my hand again, Kev, is it okay if I come up? He allowed me to come back up. And I said, what do you think about today? You have your daughter waiting for you. You know, we've talked about a lot of different things here, but your daughter's there for you. Sounds like you've been going through some really, really rough times. You will have the opportunity for things to turn around by coming back over. So he thought about this for a while. And then he looked up at me and he he told me, he goes, I'm going to come back over. Hi, everyone. You're very welcome back to Grit Media. I'm your host, Maria Means. Today, we are going to be joined in studio by Kevin Briggs. He's a former Highway Patrol officer who became known worldwide as the guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge. Kevin has many years of experience and he talked up to 600 people down from jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge to commit suicide. He is an author, he's a speaker, and he's a suicide prevention advocate and this topic is extremely important to him. Before we get into the conversation, I would like to say, I think it goes without saying, that some of the themes and the topics that we are going to be discussing around the issue of suicide may be very difficult for some of our viewers to hear. So although this may be a difficult conversation to have, I think it is an important one for us to have. Evan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon from California. We're delighted to have you. I know your story has gone all over the world and you're very busy doing a lot of interviews. Uh, so how are you? I'm good. I'm happy to be here with you. Thank Thanks. you for having me. Thank you so much. Would you mind, Kevin, just briefly for our viewers, introducing yourself, a bit about your job in the California Highway Patrol. I know you're retired since 2013 and you do a lot of public speaking and work with schools as well. Right. My name's Kevin Briggs and I was with the California Highway Patrol for 23 years and I did a lot of work on the Golden Gate Bridge uh, in California and I met a lot of people from all over the world. It was It was a great job. But the bridge also has this very dark side to it. It is the number one spot in the United States for loss of life to suicide. So I did a lot of work with people who were contemplating suicide up on that bridge. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot. I really did about human dynamics, learned a lot about myself. So it was a very gratifying job to work with folks, but I also lost some. And when it breaks your heart and you're always thinking, what could I have done better? Mm -hmm. So I retired in 2013 and now I travel and talk about my own depression and what has gone on in my life and how we can have that talk with someone. You know, how do we communicate with someone who may be suicidal? What do we say? What do we not say? So how can we make them feel comfortable? So this is kind of my life's work now. And Kevin, in terms of your job in the California Highway Patrol, was that something that you always wanted to do growing up? Did you very much get want to get into something where you were helping people? You know, I did. I actually worked in corrections um, for a number of years. And then one of the guys I was working with said, hey, I'm going out for the Highway Patrol. And he asked me to go along with him. So I applied and I thought, oh, I don't know, the Highway Patrol, those, the, they look squared away. They look the pretty professional. I don't know if I can do it, but I went through the academy and of course made it, went on and started working on the Golden Gate Bridge, having no training. I didn't know what to say to folks who were contemplating suicide. And I thought, you know, is, is, is it on me? Am I in trouble? If somebody jumps, um, it was tough. It really, really was. And every case was a little bit different, but I would handle four to six cases a month of folks contemplating suicide uh, from that bridge. So I had to learn and learn quick 
how how I can interact with someone and try to make a difference to make them want to come back over that pedestrian rail. And Kevin, as part of your, your patrol, you were given the area of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I think a lot of us have heard a lot about the bridge and I've never been there in person, but it's sort of known as being something which is very beautiful and majestic and this sort of iconic structure. Is it like that in person? What, what was it like for you working, working down there? It is. I loved working down there, even though it's cold. It's cold almost year round. But I met people from all over the world. And you know, generally, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it does have this dark side to it as a suicide destination for folks. But I really did enjoy working down there. The vast majority of people came there to celebrate life, birthdays or retirements or anniversaries. So it, it was a wonderful place to work. And what's remarkable about your story, Kevin, is that in your role, you sort of unknowingly got into this job of having to deal with people who were on the bridge. Obviously, as you say, there's that great side to it and the beautiful view, but also the issue of, of suicide. How many people in your career do you think you talked to on the bridge who were suicidal? I'd say several hundred. I would handle four to six cases a month of folks who were suicidal, whether that be standing over that pedestrian rail or on the sidewalk or in one of the parking lots. So it, it turned out to be a lot of people who were suffering. And as you mentioned, you said it is the number one location in the USA for suicides. Why do you think that is? Why the Golden Gate Bridge? Do people pick that location? You know, I think they're drawn to it. Um, one gentleman I asked who was over the rail, I asked him why this bridge? Because he, he had flown out to California from the East Coast about as far as ways you can get in the United States. And I asked him, why this bridge? And he told me it'll get the job done. And unfortunately, he did leap and it did get the job done. But folks look at it as what I've heard anyway, is falling through the air sets them free. The water cleanses them. But uh, I, in my experience, it's vastly different what actually occurs. And when the, the bridge was built, I think it was in 1936, 1937, the chief architect at the time, a man called Joseph Strauss, I think, he sort of said, look, this bridge is going to be suicide proof. He didn't envisage that people were going to commit suicide. Obviously, something very different has played out. And I know when you were working there, there was no barrier, there was no net for the people that might have jumped. Um, part of that, I think, was cost, wasn't it? That it was very expensive to bring that in. Yes, I think it started out 142 million, something in that range, uh, years ago, and it and has since grown um, substantially since then. It's still not complete, but it's getting there. I do drive across the bridge frequently, and and then I've walked across it. Um, you can see the progress being made. So it, it was a lot of money still is going on but it will definitely save lives there and i know before the interview i was talking to you and uh, you spoke about a man who who sadly lost a daughter to suicide and he was very much in favor on the bridge of having this barrier put up even though some people would say well it might obstruct the view and it, it's sort of weighing up is it about that life or is it about the view yes i was actually at a training class shortly after i retired and he approached me and, and he had lost his daughter to suicide on the bridge. And I handled the case and we were talking and he asked me my view about it. And I didn't really like it because it is, even though it's maybe 30 people a year lose their life on that bridge, the amount of people that come to that bridge, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, come to walk across and drive across that bridge. So... I thought in my mind at the time, that view is very, very important. That's what draws people up here, to be able to look straight down on that bridge and see the ships going underneath and the porpoises and the seals and things. It creates a really neat experience. But he looked at me and he held his hands up cupped like this. And he said, Kevin, I want you to think about this. You have you know, a view or a life. Mm -hmm. And he really swayed me right then. Mm -hmm. he, he really did. I, I felt embarrassed and ashamed. Um, and I tell folks, you know, I've never lost a loved one. I've lost a, some folks up on that bridge, but not a loved one. So 
my other part of this was for the amount of money being spent on this suicide barrier, what could we have done in the Bay Area for suicide prevention also? So there's a, a lot of things to weigh doing this when you're thinking about this, but it is going up. It's, it's being erected as we speak. Um, and I think after looking at it, that it really will stop the suicides on the Golden Gate Bridge. I just hope the folks won't do something else. Yeah, of course, Kevin. Um, I know that this is such a difficult thing to answer, maybe impossible to answer, but from your experience, what is the driving emotion or the driving thing or the force that brings someone to that point where they consider this is my answer jumping off this bridge? You know, I think in talking with a lot of folks, most of the time they've been through a number of things, a number of crises in their life, whether they lost someone, um, whether they have been bullied or abused, a number of things have occurred and they haven't found a way to cope with what has been going on. So maybe they suffer from a mental illness, they isolate themselves, but they just can't find a way to get past what has been going on in their lives. And I think the only way to end it is through suicide. And another point, is there, when you were working there in your experience, did you see that there was maybe a certain demographic, a certain age of a person or male or female who was more likely uh, to attempt to end their life? Generally, when I was working there, it was white males mm -hmm. and to tend to be the prominent individual who would come up and attempt suicide on that bridge. And we have seen the ages getting younger and younger and younger through the, through mm. the years now also, which is sad. And I know you were in such a position, it's just an incredible position to have to be in, to, to speak to someone. And I know you dealt with up to 600 cases. And as you said, in, in those sort of cases, direct cases, you very sadly lost two people. But what was, were the sort of things that you would say to someone who has gotten to that point and I know you've described it before as like an end stage cancer where they're they've gotten that far and you're the one who's speaking to them in those which could be their last moments. What I really wanted to do was be a sounding board for them just to listen to them if they're willing to talk me just being there and not giving them advice and telling them what they should have done mm. you know instead of saying to someone well you know what you should have done I think that kind of slaps them in the face how about have you tried this? But really listening and finding out what is important to them, their values, their beliefs, and then how can I kind of turn that around so they see it a little bit different? And it can, can take maybe 20 minutes. It can take you know eight hours. So we have to be there for them and allow them to speak. That's the biggest thing because think about a time when you're very, very upset is you being allowed to speak without interruption, you're allowed to vent. So that's what we're looking for, is allowing people to take as much time as needed, talk about what's been going on in their lives. Not that I or somebody else working up there can fix anything, but we can certainly be a sounding board for them. And what is going through your mind, Kevin, in those moments of negotiation? I think this is so interesting for people to try and envisage this. So many of us have not been in this position. I think you're in a position where, you know, the veil between life and death is so thin and you're dealing with just, it must be an incredible pressure. I'm trying to find out what is this individual telling me or what can I hope to bring out that would make them want to come back over that rail and live. So whether that is someone they love, maybe that's a responsibility, a long-term goal, something in their belief system, you know, a child. What is it that we can try to focus on to get them to want to come back over and live another day? And for you personally, how has this experience shaped you? Because I'm sure, you know, when you were a young officer going into this, you were probably a very different person than who you are now. I was. And I did not, when I first started, I did not know much about mental illness, even though I've been suffering for for decades, I didn't want to accept it. I had these macho jobs. I was in the United States Army in the infantry. I worked at San Quentin State Prison. And then here I was with the Highway Patrol, these macho jobs where you simply don't show a weakness. Mm -hmm. you It's almost you're not allowed to show a weakness. 
I thought maybe I would lose friends, lose my job, but none of that happened. You know, I started learning more, not only about how to talk to folks and learning more about them, but about myself and my own strengths and weaknesses. And how can I become better? Because I would have these days of depression where I wouldn't want to do anything. I could sit in the house the whole day and, and not want to wash clothes, go to the grocery store, not do anything. And where, how can this be? How can I like go to work? It'd be fine. Everything be good. But then days when I would go home, you know, not be good and have nightmares and, and these different things. So it wasn't until I really wanted to get some help and learning more about myself is when things started to turn around. So I think there's a lot of a focus on you helping people in this, but actually you would say all these experiences that you've been through and, and what you've seen has actually helped you in your life as well. It has. Yes, mm -hmm. it's been very mutual, even though I don't want to look at it like that. I'm there yeah. for those folks. Mm -hmm. It is mutual, yes. And so the the people who are negotiating now, there are still people that do this work. Are they are those officer officers trained? Were you trained when you when you went in, or is it more a matter of having to get out there and do it and, and the, the experience? When I first started working on the bridge, I, I had no training in this. I didn't know what to say, what to do. It was really, it was horrifying. I yeah. thought, you know, if this individual jumps, am I responsible? It was terrible. It really was. I didn't know how to even approach people to begin the conversation. So I learned as I kind of went along and I would talk to a lot of people who were contemplating suicide when they would come back. You know, what could I have done better? What did I do that wasn't so good? What did I do that was good? So I developed my own kind of path along here on how to talk to folks during these extreme times. But the officers nowadays, they get a little bit of training. They do. I wish it was more. I'm not going full, full blown negotiator, but at least mm -hmm. enough training to where they feel a little more comfortable. Nobody ever feels comfortable. I got this. Let me do it. Let me go right up and talk to this person. It's always tough, but at least you'll have some idea of some things to say not to say how to approach, you know, when to back off a bit. And if we're not making that connection, maybe we can try to get somebody else in that can. And I think one of the things when I read your story that I thought was interesting, a lot of people maybe think, well, it's a situation where you're going and you're grabbing someone at the last minute. But for you, your approach that you took was very much, I want that person to come over on their own terms, that that's them coming over to me and there's that relationship and that trust, which is very hard. It's something that's very hard to build, but that was the approach that, that you went with. I do. Yes, it's about building rapport and getting them to see a different side of what they're already going through. Not to make things up and to promise them everything's going to be better. I don't know that. I'm just dealing with them for a few hours. But if we can talk about things and get them to want to come back over that rail... I think their chances of survival long term are much, much better than if I just walk up there and grab them and pull them back over. Yeah, that that's that's very to me, it's disheartening. Um, it is tough. That's what you want to do. You want to grab them, bring them back over and, and, and keep them safe. But I also want to look at long term. And, and that's how I kind of go into this. And there is this very famous case that you were involved with and the image of you negotiating with this man. It was an African-American gentleman and it went all over the world. Um, I think it was maybe in 2005. But in the negotiation, it maybe lasted something like 90 minutes. And he never, you know, in the image you can see, he's not looking at you in that whole time. You were just listening and he wasn't making eye contact. Would you tell us a bit about this case? I think his name was Kevin Berthea. Yes, yes. So we have me, Kevin, and and, and him, Kevin. So we make Jack this easy. Kevin. <laughs> Kevin and Kevin. Yeah. I was just on routine patrol, you know, just another day. And I received a call of a man on the sidewalk, actually, on a cell phone saying that he's going to jump off the bridge. So I start working my way. I rode a motorcycle uh, so I could go on the sidewalks. They're wide enough. And I start working my way down the sidewalk. And as I near the North Tower, I see him. He's matching the description and he's still on a cell phone. So I stop around 50 feet or so away from him. And as I'm getting off of my motorcycle, he looks my direction 
and then runs over and jumps over that pedestrian rail. The only thing I could do was yell at him. And I yelled something to him. I can't remember what it was. But when I did that, he reached out, grabbed the rail, swung around and, and slammed into the pillars there. When I come up to someone is I want to get their attention. And I just raise my right hand and say, hi, I'm Kevin. Is it okay if I come up with and talk with you for a while? I want to get their permission because they see the uniform. You know, they figure I'm somebody of authority. So I just want to go up as Kevin. And he didn't want anything to do with me. He kept yelling at me. If you come one step closer, I'm jumping. And he's, he's really mad. He's angry. He just wants to be left alone. So I kept on him and said, I'm not going to come up and touch you, grab you, anything, nor is anybody else. I just want to come up and talk with you for a while. And it took quite a while before he allowed me to come up there. It was like a step by step and easing my way up. And when I finally got up to him, you know, he didn't look up. He looked down. And for folks who can see that picture, take a look. His head is down. His left hand is in his pocket. And it's so cold out there, his right hand, which you can't see, is actually up between his skin and his T-shirt. He's cold out there. It's, it's almost always cold out there. So we have a lot of things going on. He wants to talk after I, again, reintroduce myself and try to get his first name. If, if he allows me, if folks allow me to use their first name, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to try to develop my rapport based on Kevin and Kevin. So he started telling me all these things that had gone on in his life. And my job wasn't to say, why'd you do that? Why are you here? Well, things are going to get better. I just wanted to listen and take all this in and to kind of validate him and normalize what is going on. So as he's telling me things, he was adopted. His birth mother gave him up very early. And that's that's a big one for folks as they get older and older. They wonder, why was I not good enough for my family? Why did they give me up? So he was adopted when he was around six months old. His adopted family loved him very much. But they uh, divorced when he was around 13 years old. And he thought he had caused this divorce. He actually had nothing to do with it, but it wasn't talked about. You know, they didn't discuss it with him why they divorced. This, along with he did suffer from a mental illness that was untreated. His coping skills were to play sports all through school. And mind you, he's telling me all this while he's looking down and we're just trying to chat and I'm trying to keep him talking this entire time so I can learn more about him and allow him to vent. So he played sports all through school, multiple sports. And as long as he could kind of run himself ragged every day, then he could get some sleep at night because at nighttime was his very, very dark time for him. He didn't do well at nights. So as long as he could be really, really tired, then he could kind of get some rest and then repeat it every single day. But once he got out of school, then he had to find something else to do. So he got a job, but one job wasn't good enough. He got two full-time jobs. And then as this progressed, he thought, you know what, if I start a family, things will get better. So he started a family and had a child, but his baby was born premature and had to stay in the hospital. Now, Kev thinks, what did I do to cause harm to this baby? How did I do this? What did I do? Again, I messed everything up. He's feeling really bad about himself. His child had to stay in the hospital a couple of months. And when she was able to come home, so did a bill for around $250,000. Now, not only had he lost one job, he had lost both of his jobs. So now he thinks, I hurt my family. I can't take care of my family. I don't do anything right. He had never been to the Golden Gate Bridge before. So he had actually been uh, from Oakland, which is in the East Bay near San Francisco. He had to get directions to come over to the Golden Gate Bridge. So this is where we are. And he's telling me all this over the course of an hour. I have to find out what we call in the negotiator's world uh, a hook. 
What can we talk about? What can I focus on that would make him, that would drive him to want to live and come back over that rail? So I started talking more about his daughter. What is she like? How old is she? Describe her to me. So he was doing all this and I could see the emotions were starting to take effect. And this went on for some time. And then I wanted to take a break. And I do this every so often because I want folks to really think about what we have been talking about. So I asked him, I said, Kev, we've been talking for a while. I want to step back and give you some time to think, but I'm only going to do so if you promise me not to do anything until I come back up here. And he said, sure. So I stepped back about 10 feet or so and gave him just a few minutes to think about things. And then after a few minutes, I raised my hand again, Kev, is it okay if I come up? He allowed me to come back up. I said, what do you think about today? You have your daughter waiting for you. You know, we've talked about a lot of different things here, but your daughter's there for you. Sounds like you've been going through some really, really rough times. You will have the opportunity for things to turn around by coming back over. So he thought about this for a while, and then he looked up at me, and he he told me, he goes, I'm going to come back over. So that's what he did. And when he did, I congratulated him, and then I asked him, what did I do that helped this situation, and what did I do that maybe wasn't so good that may have hurt the situation? Because I want to learn to be better at this to help other people. He thought about it briefly, and then he said, you know what? You listened. You let me speak and you listened. So what he's telling me is I didn't try to fix anything there. Just let him speak and vent and get everything out without judgment, without telling him what he should have done. So I didn't see him for a very, very long time um, until we were kind of put back together again at, due to uh, an, an organization that wanted me to come out to New York City and receive an award. At first, I told them no, because it's not just me that, that does this type of thing. There are other people, other officers that do this type of work. But they had reached out to my commander, who's in charge of my area office for the Highway Patrol, and he kind of tells me, okay, you're going to go out there and you're going to accept this award. And then they asked me if there's someone I had saved that they could bring out and present this award to me. And I don't use the word saved when I'm talking about myself. I think I was there for a very, very dark time for people. So I say, I, you know, I helped them through a dark time. But um, a couple of weeks after this incident with Kevin Murthia, his mother had written me a letter. And I have that letter here. So I'd like to read it for you if I could. Thank you so much. Yes. Dear Mr. Briggs, nothing will erase the events of March 11th, but you are one of the reasons Kevin is still with us. I truly believe Kevin was crying out for help. He has been diagnosed with a mental illness for which he has been properly medicated. I adopted Kevin when he was only six months old, completely unaware of any hereditary traits. But thank God, now we know. Kevin is straight, as he says. We truly thank God for you, sincerely indebted to you, Narvella Berthea. And then there's a, a PS on the bottom. So what happens was when we take folks off of that bridge, we take them to a local hospital for a mental health evaluation every single time. So on the bottom there's, when I visited San Francisco General Hospital that evening, you were listed as the patient. Boy, did I have to straighten that one out. So they actually had Kevin Briggs in there instead of Kevin Berthea. They had you mixed up. So I thought that was kind of funny. Wow, Kevin, that's such an incredible letter. And it's just, it's so moving. And it's incredible you were able to stay in touch. You know, you're actually, the two Kevins are now, you know, this is your good friend. Right. We get to speak together uh, more and more and more now, which is a lot of fun. I enjoy speaking with them. You know, there's no ego. It's about what our stories and what can we do to help the audience. Right for okay. this. So 
it, it's a lot of fun. If I could work with him every single time, it's great. But we are doing more and more work together. And and, and he's a really neat guy. If you ever get a chance to listen to him. Yeah, it, I definitely it, will. It's a tough subject, but uh -huh. we got to do this. And I did actually um, read a bit about his personal story. And I know he now speaks. He's a brilliant speaker. He shares his story. And I think one of the really striking things that he shares about that day is that when he was on the way to the bridge, and it's very sad, obviously he'd come from Oakland, and he had asked several times for directions, so he knew where it was, but in his head he sort of thought, well, if I you know, reach out to a few people and I ask, maybe someone will see you know, something in my face, something in my eyes, and they'll ask, you know, why, why, why do you want to go to the bridge? And they'll stop him. You know, so he was very much, I think, looking for a reason to keep living and he wasn't finding it. And I think that sort of brings up the issue of, you know, the signs of suicide, that sometimes we might not see the signs. You know, we can be completely blind. He, he finally came across a lady and she just, you know, gave him a plain look and said it's that way. And she wasn't able to see the signs. Would you say there are signs that people can, can look for? You know, I would say there, there are. But we also have to remember, folks are very good at hiding things also. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you things to look for, and, and I will. But I also want you to remember, folks are, are good at hiding these also. Or maybe I'll see something, one thing, and somebody else will see one thing, and, and we don't put it together. But generally, what we're looking for is talk, behavior, and mood. Have they been talking about killing themselves? or no one will miss me when I'm gone, of uh, being in unbearable pain, you know, and their behavior. A big one with suicide is isolation. And what I have seen is not only are they just isolating themselves in their house, but they're isolating themselves in a room. They don't want any contact. They just want to be left alone. Maybe giving away possessions that you know they typically would not do, or sleeping too much or using drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism. And then their mood, do they seem irritable? They used to come out and you'd have coffee two, three times a week. You know, even if they come out now, they're just irritable. Um, they're very sad and they've lost interest in things that they used to like to do. So those are some of the things that we look at is talk, behavior and mood. Yeah, and I think as you mentioned, a big thing uh, with Kevin Berthea was he felt as though you were listening to him. It wasn't like you stood for an hour and a half and just listened. And I think sometimes it can be so hard because we maybe, we want to interrupt, we want to share our own experience on something. We want to relate it to ourselves and actually what the person is looking for is just to be heard. Yes, absolutely. We have to remember this is not about us. This mm -hmm. is about that individual. Now, sometimes if we have things in common, we can start to talk about that and see what happens. We, you know, we go with commonalities can create comfort. And in terms of the reality, the awful reality of jumping from the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and I know you said it is the number one suicide location in the USA. Um, and in terms of jumping from it, there is this sort of romanticism, almost this mythical sense um, that you can read about online, where you, as you said before, you jump between these giant golden arches and you're almost entering into another dimension. It's like a portal uh, to another world and you hit the water and that cleanses you from all your suffering, things like that. And while this might be something that is in someone's head when they're considering this, you highlight that the reality is actually completely horrendous. It's completely different from that. It is. When you're on that sidewalk, you're about 220 feet into the air. Um, I'm not sure of the meters, but you're about 220 feet in the air. And if someone decides to jump, that's a four or five second fall down to this water. And when they hit, they hit at about 75 miles an hour. And if they don't die on impact, generally they break a lot of bones. Uh, maybe your ribs that puncture your lungs or your liver, or your spleen, you break your arms. And then most of the time they will flail and then drown. It's a horrendous way to go. It is not easy. It's not pleasant. Um, people may think it is, but having seen these from folks, 
it, it, it is a horrible way to go. So don't think that it's an easy way out. It is not. And, and you would say that people, they probably don't realize the brutality of that when they're considering that how bad that sort of death is. Yes, it's a very tough way to go. It is not easy. And, and a lot of times it's not just hitting and dying. It's, it's suffering that goes on too. And I know describing the fall there, you said, you know, it's like 220 foot down. You're at 75 miles an hour. What are the chances, if any, of someone surviving a fall like that? There have been a few folks that have survived the fall, but they've also been, been fairly heavily damaged in their body also. So, you know, there there is that few percent uh, that have lived, but it takes a toll on them. Another thing which I read was that you have spoken to a few survivors and even though it's it's very rare and one of the thing that things that suicide survivors might say is that there is this sort of and it's quite scary to think about there's this sort of split second realization once you you leave once you jump that they say you know they realize look i made the wrong decision and there's that regret yes and some people have told me that i've heard different things but i am aware that that some folks they second that they let go of that rail they've said what have i done i want to live that's a long way down and most of the time they they don't live so there's you know that instant regret mm -hmm. and though it's very hard to talk about you know you've saved you've i know you don't say you've saved but you've helped to negotiate with so many people on the bridge unfortunately there have been cases where you've been directly involved and you haven't being able to to save the life of that individual and there was a very sad case wasn't there of someone who you know had reached out had shaken your hand several times and had said look I have to go yes there was an African-American man on the other side of the rail and I spoke to him for for some time he wouldn't provide his name to me he wouldn't say a lot but uh, he was dressed you know he looked just like any other person out there Whatever was going on, he didn't want to get into it. He was very cordial and polite, but he did turn around on three occasions and shake my hand and thank me for being there. Mm -hmm. And on the third time, he he shook my hand and said, Kevin, thank you very much. I have to go. Uh, and he left. And it just is so brutal and just breaks your heart. Here's this guy. He... He was just really suffering and you know, whatever was going on in his life. So it, it's mm -hmm. terrible, absolutely terrible to watch. Mm -hmm. And there was there was another case of a gentleman, a young guy, he was called Jason. And his story sort of highlights very clearly the lack of hope that, that people in this position feel. And he talked to you about Pandora's box, isn't that right? Yes, and he was actually sitting on what we call the core. It's like this I-beam on the other side of the pedestrian rail. Uh, brilliant young guy, just 32 years old from the East Coast, had flown out here to the bridge. Yeah. And he suffered from a mental illness, which most do. He was supposed to be on some medications, but the medications weren't going right with him. A lot of things going on. And he was just tired of it and he had a lot of shame with him for, for things that you know were just daily things that he was involved with. But he was a brilliant young guy, not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. He was well-versed in all sorts of things, in politics and religion, a really neat individual. Mm -hmm. But he was just suffering so much that he could not see tomorrow. You know, And at one point after we'd been speaking with him for about an hour, he spoke about Pandora's box and asked us if we knew about it. And I said, yes. And he said, well, when I open Pandora's box, hope is the greatest evil. And it was very, very profound. I didn't know what to say to that. I had never heard something like that. So he was just so, you know, he's looking for hope. And every time he would do this, hope was just out of reach, according to him. So he did take his own life that day. And it was brutal to watch him go down. Um, 
And right after this, we had another one that jumped in a different location of the bridge. And an hour and a half prior to all of this occurring, we had another one. We had three that day. So, you know, it starts with us seeing this occurring and then it just spreads out. People talk about a ripple effect, but I, I go way further than that. It's more like a tsunami, but, you know, hitting the family members. And it's something you will never forget. It's brutal and whatever... I and others like me, including Kevin Berthia, if we can come out and talk to folks and, and help them out and try to prevent some of this, you know, that is our job, that is our goal now. And I think you mentioned the three things that you see a lot of the time that people have in common who are suicidal and attempt this. They have a mental illness, they've maybe come off medication, and they also feel as though they're a burden to their family. And I mean, this couldn't be further from the truth because as you've just said, it's a complete tsunami for families. It really is, you know, and maybe they've lived with it for some time, but, and, and folks may talk about it for some time, but then when it actually happens, it just breaks people, it just shatters you. It is so brutal to watch families go through this. And for you, Kevin, you're clearly someone who has so much empathy. And I think just as humans, it's very hard, you know, to put yourself in someone else's shoes. You, you can't really do that. It's very, very hard to do. But for you, uh, I know your personal experiences and also the loss of your grandfather as well have really, I think, given you that empathy and have shaped you and, and helped you to connect with people who are struggling. You know, I'm, I agree with you 100 percent. And sometimes... We have to go through things in order for us to be better and to, and to learn about it. You know, I see some folks who don't believe in mental illness. Ah, that's a weakness. That's that. Until they have it in their family and they see what it does to the individual and the family. And then they're right there, you know, with us agreeing about it and talking about it. So I hope and pray that folks don't have to go through this or have it in their family. Unfortunately, we're seeing it more and more. Mm -hmm. But there are things that we can do, you know, and, and seeing a counselor, if you need medication, take the medication, uh, whatever that may be, counseling services, all these things that I didn't want to do and agree with, I've now done and continue to do because I want this quality of life. And then to come out and talk about it and say, you know what, it can be okay. It can be a long road, but we keep trying different things. And you, very sadly, did lose your own grandfather to suicide. You know, is that something that has stayed with you and has, has given you that sense of compassion for people? You know, I think that burns in my head some. He died before I was even born, so I never even got a chance to meet him. And that's how I look at that loss is, well, what would our friendship have been like? Would he have taken me fishing a lot? And what could we have done together? That, that never even started, that never even began, so. And do you think, Kevin, the situation at the Golden Gate Bridge now is getting better or worse from what you know? It's remained about the same. There's still, last year, there was, I think, 180 people that they took off for a mental health evaluation, and um, I believe it was 20 people lost their life to suicide. You know, it will get better when this barrier is completed, it will. I'm just hoping that folks don't do something else mm -hmm. and in ireland we do have a problem with suicide it seems to be something that has become very prominent in recent years um for you i mean for people watching who maybe suspect someone they know a friend or a loved one is very low and could be contemplating suicide and you maybe some of the signs you talked about they've picked up on that what advice would you have for having a conversation with someone like that, would you, you know, directly ask the question? Because I think a lot of us might take the approach, look, this is maybe none of my business. Right. Well, just in the States, we're losing over 47,000 people a year. It's all of our business. Mm -hmm. So you see someone who might be hurting, not everybody's suicidal, but they could be going through a very tough time, a lot of different things going on in their life. So simply by having that conversation, hey, I've been noticing this, you've been staying in more, you know, you used to come out and have, and, and, and have beer with us or whatever that may be. These are the things I've been seeing. I just want to let you know I'm here for you. And if you want to talk about it, I want to let you know that I'm here. And if they do want to talk about it and they're saying things to validate them, simply a, a statement like, you know what? That sounds really tough, all the things you're going through. And they think, yes, absolutely, you get it. 
And if you are going to talk about suicide by normalizing what they're going through, you know what? Anybody that's been going through all this might be thinking about killing themselves. Have you been thinking about killing yourself? Because a lot of times folks feel they're stuffed in the corner by themselves and nobody else is going through this. By normalizing what they're going through, that can really help them to break out and want to talk about it. And like practically, if someone were to say, yes, I am thinking of suicide, what should the response be? Is it to tell you know a professional or, or what's the next step? I would say none of us want to hear that. So first thing yeah. I would say, take a couple of breaths because that's going to be a tough one. All right. How long have you been thinking about this? Give some more information. See what they say. You know, if you are thinking about it, have you tried this before? Whatever that means was. And what stopped you? Well, I couldn't do this to my family. Great. Now you have a hook. Well, you know, but I want to be here for you. That's great that you didn't want to do it to your family, but I want to let you know that I'm here for you. And if it sounds like it's something that they are really contemplating, don't be afraid to get help, whether you need to call the authorities, take them to a hospital, whatever that may be. Are they going to be mad at you? Probably. But you know what? They're still here. They may, may be mad at you for a week, a month, six months, but your bond will be stronger because you cared and you were the only one of the few that would come up and actually talk to them about that. And in all of the cases you've dealt with, Kevin, I know you mentioned Kevin Berthea and you keep in touch with him. Have you heard back from any other people, any other survivors? No, nobody's reached out and mm -hmm. said something um, to me. And I never reach out. I don't follow up with anybody because that, 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 I think that's improper. What would yeah. I say to them? Yeah. So, no, I did handle a lot of cases. And, and that's great. You know, I hope those folks are continuing on with life, having a good quality life. And I hope the very best for them. You know, Kevin and I are, aren't looking for attention from anybody. We may have helped. Yeah. We just want to get out there and talk to folks. How can we have this conversation? Where do we have this conversation? What do we say? What do we not say? How can we help one another? And it's very, I would say, cathartic for us. It's almost therapy yeah. for us afterwards to talk to people. And for you, what is the impact of all of this humanly? I know it must be quite emotionally draining and having to go back to work you know the next day after you've seen something like this and I know you also speak about a thing called compassion fatigue and you talk to professionals about taking care of themselves as well to be able to do this work yes that's very important and it it's brutal but I would tell officers working up on that bridge because of the high number of people that we contact you are probably going to lose someone I don't want you to think that you're Superman or Superwoman going out there and doing this. It's tough. You may lose someone. Here are some of the tricks of the trade that I have learned. But I also want you to think about how many people have you helped too? And if you're not doing it, who will? Because a lot of people didn't, you know, they don't want to work down on that bridge because of this. It can be very scary. It takes a lot out of you. So I want folks to think, that would do this type of work, you may lose some. How do we get past that? Don't be afraid to get help for yourself. When we're looking at compassion fatigue, and we're looking at maybe loss of feelings of empathy now. It's just more mundane, getting through the day, maybe feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by all of this or detached and, and numb even. So we need to be able to see what is going on with us because we want to do a good job. We want to be back out there. Um, and if we need help with this, by all means, get that help so you can come out and do the good job that you want to do. And finally, Kevin, would you have a message for our viewers who are maybe watching this interview or listening along? Because um, I think you know, you're very clear on the fact there is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and suicide is something which, although it's a problem, it is preventable. Yes, I want you to tell you, do what you can. Look at coping mechanisms for yourself. Don't be afraid to get some help, especially guys. Okay. We're thinking that, that we're these big, powerful men and we can handle everything. We can't. At times in our life, we need help and it's perfectly fine. For those on the other side of this that do want to help someone, I'm going to tell you, listen to understand, to try and understand, not to fix things, 
but to be there for folks. But those of us, they can research on the computer. Be careful what you read. But if you have a great source and something that you trust, you know, look at coping mechanisms, coping skills. I want you to think about yourself. How are you doing? Okay. We're all going to have bad days. We do. And bad mental health days. But if that goes on for a couple of weeks, it's time to start thinking about seeing somebody. Kevin, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. I know you're always doing interviews all around the world, so you're very, very gracious to take the time out to speak with us. And I also know it'll help so many people who are going to watch this as well. So thank you. Well, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. It's a very tough subject. I thank you for bringing me on. You know, But if we don't talk about this, we're going to lose more people. So thank you.